So the turnout in Glasgow in the last local election is 39%. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the turnout in Glasgow is so low, even compared to other parts of Scotland where it is also low? I mean, I think the challenge for in Glasgow has historically been low turnouts. I mean, the features of the both the Scottish general and the local government elections, um, relatively uh, low turnouts, irrespective of whether you have a first past the post system or a proportional system, because those of us who argued for a proportional system thought that would improve turnout. Turned out, turned out not to be the case. What are the reasons for it? Um, it's hard. I think partly, as in some parts of of Scotland and, and bits of Glasgow, there might be a sense that it doesn't matter how you vote. It's, they're all the same, might be the kind of mantra that comes out. I mean, they aren't all the same, but people can have that sense of it. Two, that perhaps the, you know, um, you know, the expectation that it's always going to be the same party, although that has changed because of the recent council result. But there's a sense that, you know, where the Labour person's going to get in. I mean, the, the thing that the press is turned out in our area is the assumption that all of this is a Labour area, and if I don't really need to bother, and yeah. it turns out it isn't always. You know, in fact, the board I'm in now, it's now only one single Labour council member out of the four. You know, whereas when I started in the, 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 the local government and then also in the, in the parliament, I mean, you would guarantee three out of the four. Yes. And in the old system, you got all the councillors because it was a majority system. But even under the last PR system in 2012 for the council, Labour got three out of the four. What are the biggest issues, in your opinion, facing Scotland and Glasgow specifically? Well, the biggest issue facing Glasgow is the continued difficult challenge of inequality, you know, and, and, and levels of... Uh, kind of long-term poverty. So, you know, irrespective of a lot of the things I think the council under Labour was trying to achieve, there are still many kind of challenges facing the city. Second thing is um, dealing with the, the, the section of the community that have never worked. So you're talking about 20 to 25% of the Glasgow um, uh, you know, population is, is either not ready for work or uh, incapable of working at the moment either because of health conditions or circumstances at home and so on. So the, so the big challenge is getting more employment and making sure that people that are the most excluded are getting chance of that employment and the second one is reducing the inequality gap. And the other big challenge is getting its fair share of resources. I mean, the, every year for the last 10 years under the SNP, Glasgow's council budget has been cut. Um, and, you know, people have chosen to give the opportunity for the minority SNP council to run the council. But the fact that since me they've been silent on that issue tells me that their priority isn't about sticking up for the city, it's about making sure that their political masters are in control. So the, the challenge facing Glasgow is, is it getting a fair share of its resources? How do we deal with inequality and how do we ensure that with economic growth that can, can occur, how do we make sure that folk that haven't benefited from that in the past can do so? The Conservative votes share in the local council elections rocketed from 30% to 25% and in the general election their best performance in Scotland since 1983. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is behind the major successes of Conservatives in Scotland in the last few years? Well, let's put it in the context. I mean, they, they, they don't run, I think they have maybe an influence in one or two councils. But the truth of the matter is that what's happened in Scottish politics is that people have been asked to define themselves based on identity politics rather than either on economic interest or concerns about issues to do with the health service, housing, or the economy. Um, so, you know, the, pr the problem has been that the more that the SNP have made the choice about, even after the result in 2014, where there was quite a conclusive rejection of a yes for it, the SNP have continued to dabble in this identity politics, and the, the, the Tories have, have managed to light on an issue that's given them a, a way back in the Scottish politics, so the, the, the people who are solely responsible for our resuscitation of the Tory party in Scotland now the SNP, curiously, because they both need each other. So, because the SNP need a big bad bogeyman of the Tories, and the Tories need that, oh, we can't break up the United Kingdom. And what that means is the politics I drive myself by in terms of why I'm in politics all my life is about, well, who's talking about how do we ensure that people from very ordinary backgrounds get the best chance education, how do we make sure that uh, you know, people are getting an opportunity to work and if they're at work they're properly well paid and so on. So the, the kind of issues are getting ignored in the last few years and it's polarised the debate between, if you, I mean curiously if you ask people to pick a flag 
it is not a surprise in bits of Scotland that people sometimes will like the Union flag as much as they like the Scotland flag. Whereas for a nationalist, they think the only flag that matters is the Scotland flag. So should a nationalist still vote for you then? I mean, where does that leave Labour? If people see the Conservatives as the party of the Union, then SNP is the party for independence? Well, because the reality is the vast majority of Scots are in between both. You know, so that all the tests of the electorate would say that they would like a, an effective, strong Scottish Parliament, but they also like the idea of being a partner in the United Kingdom. So the test for Labour is to find a brand of politics that breaks through these two strangleholds that are killing Scotland. I think the, the economy is tanking in Scotland because we don't have any sense of certainty about where we're going because there's a constant invoking of we'll have another referendum. Two, I think the, the, the politics of Scotland has become, the language has been debased, you know, so that, you know, uh, people think if you wave a flag enough, that's going to solve all your problems. And I think the third challenge is Labour needs to have a strong sense of being pro the United Kingdom because it makes economic sense, particularly in places like Glasgow, because the economic dislocation of Glasgow, in my opinion, would be immense under independence in the sh as a minimum in the short to medium term but also promote a vision of Scotland that talks about tackling inequality, ensuring fairness, giving people a chance in life, and at the same time having a parliament that's focused on day-to-day -day issues. I think it was the Evening Times I read that they said you gave your backing to Anna Sarwar that's over correct, yeah. Richard yeah. Leonard. Can you uh -huh. just explain why you think he'd be a better leader? Well, I think we're choosing who could be the next First Minister of Scotland, so I look at Anna as career and say, well, he's been a member of parliament, he's been a member of the Scottish parliament, he was certainly a key activist and organiser around the Glasgow campaigns of the last few years, so I know him well enough to know that he puts Glasgow first. I also think that in terms of the health service, he has made the health service the number one issue in terms of the debates in the Scottish parliament about how the SNP have been really bad at workforce planning, how they've Actually, as revealed yesterday, we had an analysis by an a, 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 a assessment being done by a professor at Oxford that they've actually reduced the spending on the NHS, although the English NHS has gone up. So puncturing one of the big myths about the referendum, the big myth about the referendum is we, we will protect the NHS and only, I guess, vote will protect us. Well, actually, they've been cutting that very NHS that they say we must protect. So I think his experience, also I know him as a Glasgow representative, and I do think it's that the Labour Party, if it has to find a way back, I, I think it has to understand how we find a way back in Glasgow, and I think Anas can demonstrate that. Some people have uh, criticised yeah. Anas Sarwa uh -huh. uh, for sending his kids to private school and for his company offering uh, recruits a wage uh -huh. of some fifty, yeah. which isn't a living wage. Do you uh -huh. think they're antithetical to Labour's values, and is that an issue for him? No, I mean, I mean, the, the choice that everybody has to make about their kids' education is a choice between them. Uh, the family, okay, and um, I would just certainly say that his track record on human rights, his track record on campaigning for the NHS, his track record of sticking up for the city of Glasgow, his experience, I think they massively outweigh any criticism that people may wish to have. I mean, none of these criticisms were ever raised when he was acting deputy leader of the Labour Party, so why have they suddenly emerged? Because some people want to make that uh, a dividing line itself. And I don't think they're antithetical in the sense that the Labour Party in the past has had people who've come from private school backgrounds, in fact people like Tony Benn, who is often invoked by the socialist left as a, as a great hero, was a product of private education. I mean, the truth is, does he believe in trying to have a fairer tax system so that those who are best, most well off are taxed more fairly? Yes, he does. Does he believe in tackling inequality in terms of the collective role of the state to do that? Of course he does. So his individual choice I don't think it's as important as some people claim that. The Herald wrote an article on the 9th of May uh, that read, if the SNP wins Glasgow City Council could represent for what many would be the final nail in the coffin of Scotland's once dominant political force to talk about Labour. Yeah. And losing power then and the SNP becoming uh, in charge uh -huh. with their minority administration, what does that mean for Labour in its future? Well, I mean, Labour's uh, electoral performances in recent years have not been anywhere near what I want them to be. But our, our result in May was actually a lot better than anybody had predicted, although we, well, we were always aware that the, the likelihood of losing control of the council. But the SNP walked into that election thinking they would be a majority council. So they ended up with a minority council. If the election of June result had been held, uh, held for May, 
we would probably have been the largest party. And in a recent by-election, the SNP got absolutely thrashed in Cardonald in Glasgow with an 8.5% swing to Labour. So, look, politics is up and down. At the moment, Labour had a period of being down, now we're up. What do you think Labour need to do to win back Scotland, then? OK, well, I think uh, I think having a programme, I mean, our, our manifesto both in the 16 Scottish election, the manifesto for the council election in Glasgow, and in the kind of positions that we took for the general election are all rooted in getting opportunity to ordinary individuals. So the kind of many, not a few slogan that was part of the manifesto in 2017. The new manifesto talked about um, making sure we're tackling inequality and poverty in the council. So I think there's a programme there that, that Labour, when, it, when it's focused on these things, if, as long as we can return to normal politics, I think there's a, there's a need for Labour and the historic purpose of why Labour was established still exists. And uh, my argument with the SNP is they will now claim that their programme for government is now part of this new dialogue. Now I would say, well, for 10 years, what were you doing? And I think ultimately people will make that judgement over the next period. I cannot see the SNP getting anything other than a further decline in their vote in the next, well, I presume it will be a Scottish election before there will be a general election. So Labour needs to have a, a message that's about making sure that it's talking up for, you know, fairness in society, having a radical programme that talks about tackling inequality and also has a sense of people speaking on its behalf that, are, that, that, that people can identify with. Because modern politics is a bit of policy. It's a bit of, um, you know, understanding where you are in terms of the debates for the day and also, but most importantly, about how you project that and how you, what your message is. So at the moment, the electorate is a bit kind of fluid, I think, about what it's looking for in political leaders. But I think if Labour can pull itself together in the Scottish Parliament and build its kind of strategy for the next election as being a credible alternative to the SNP, there's always a chance.